Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, July 13th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight. Give them nothing, but take from them everything. We saw the Greek people say, Mulan Labe, come and take it. In defiance, this week we see after they browbeat uh, the, the prime minister of Greece, uh, he says, come and take it in a supine position. Uh, they said two different reports said he looked like a beaten dog after he came out of these meetings. The people of Greece are fighting off debt. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. They raised the taxes so it's impossible. They already have huge taxes on tourism. They wanted to add another 15% VAT across the board, which will make it too expensive to go there. Yeah. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. What a difference a week makes. It was just last weekend that we saw the Greek people in the spirit of Thermopylae say, Mulan Lave, come and take it, defying the economic blackmail that they had suffered under for a week. Now we see a week later, their prime minister emerging after an all night meeting, looking according to multiple accounts, like a whipped dog. After 14 hours of meetings, he was told by the president of the European Council, Donald Tusk, you're not leaving this room. Two hours later, they threw in the towel. Now we have what essentially amounts to a fire sale of the Greek people's sovereignty as well as their economic future. To give you an idea of what they've agreed to, they have handed over the power to Brussels to uh, set tax policy, to set pension policy. They're going to raise taxes, of course. They're going to cut pensions. They are going to set all kinds of economic laws for them. That is handing over sovereignty. When someone else is making your laws, you have handed over the sovereignty. This has always been the plan with these economic unions. They come in and say, this is just about free trade. We're going to create a free trade block, and everybody is going to be much better, they say. We hear that today with the TPP, with the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trans-Pacific Partnerships. That is not what is happening. They're creating an economic union. Then they can create economic crisis. Then they can step in and take the sovereignty of the nations. We've heard this from Alan Greenspan. We've heard it from the largest bond companies saying that the only way that this is going to be solved is for sovereignty to be handed over. That is what is happening. And of course, the former finance minister who resigned last weekend, I'm sure he saw this coming. He knew the inside story. He said he was going to resign if the Greek people accepted the bailout terms that were being presented to them last week. And of course, they didn't, but he still resigned. I think he knew that the Greek government was going to accept it Nevertheless, he said that uh, this is essentially the same as the coup that was forced upon them in 1967. But instead of banks, it was tanks. Exactly the case. They say that what this amounted to was mental waterboarding of the prime minister, although it's not clear exactly uh, if he doesn't want to go along with this. This is an $86 billion extension of loans. They're going to extend and pretend this is supposed to be ratified by Wednesday. They're only going to give them a couple of days to look at it. Doesn't this sound familiar? Just like these multinational trade agreements are being written in secret, you get a couple of days for your elected representatives to take a look at it and then decide something that is very important for the future. And of course, one of the key issues of this, besides transferring the sovereignty, is taking away real assets. 50 billion euros worth of real assets are going to be surrendered to the banks. They're calling it privatization. But of course, what they're going to do is set up a private investment fund, you know who's going to have access to that. You know who's going to be in on the ground floor. As the London Financial Times has dubbed it, it is the most intrusive economic supervision program that has ever been mounted in the EU. And we need to remember how they got into this. There's been multiple articles in the last couple of weeks talking about how Goldman Sachs could be sued for helping to hide the debts when it got Greece into the European Union. Essentially, Goldman Sachs cooked the books. They lied about Greeks, uh, the Greek uh, pers uh, financial situation in order to get them into the European Union. They say Greece managed to stay within the strict Maastricht rules for Eurozone membership largely because of complex financial deals created by Goldman Sachs, which critics say disguised the extent of the country's outstanding debts. You see, 
That's why they call these debts odious. A previous administration lied and indebted the Greek people, put them into an economic situation that they never should have been in. And of course, Goldman Sachs, for all of that, made $500 million in profits, half a billion dollars in profits. Just one of the Goldman Sachs bankers was paid $12 million to establish that deal. Many people are suggesting to them that they should sue Goldman Sachs to at least get some of that compensation back. But you understand as you see the tax policy being moved from Athens, from the Greek capital to the to Brussels, the capital of the EU, to these bankers who are going to now set tax policy, that could never happen here, could it? Of course it can. We already have a regime that is trying to do this. This is part of the G20, as well as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. That's the OECD, is how it typically goes by that. They are now talking about having eliminating tax competitions between states. In other words, they want to go to a global tax regime, set taxes globally, because right now we have tax competition, or as they call it, harmful tax competition. So they don't want people competing, different governments competing for lower tax rates, trying to get companies, trying to get uh, work in different areas. And this is all being sold as a way of controlling multinational corporations. That's the same way the Pope is trying to sell this global regime to stop global warming. He says the multinational corporations are too big for any individual nation to handle, so we have to have a global government to control the multinational corporations. The same thing they're saying about this assault on tax competition. You understand it's the multinational corporations that are driving this. The multinational corporations are not only in control of the national governments, it's the multinational corporations that are creating this transnational structure in secret with corporate lobbyists. This is the plan to take over our economies. And of course, it is not a way to keep a check on the multinational corporations. But of course, the TPP, the TTIP, the transatlantic part of that going between uh, the U.S. and Europe, that is moving ahead. In Brussels, we see the EU has hailed the, uh, the Brussels Parliament has hailed the TTIP recommendations. They say that they are backing the TTIP. And this is how they're selling it. They're selling it. Uh, it's a lot of uh, pushes coming from uh, the automotive industry, what is called uh, CLEPA in Europe, C-L-E-P-A. They say the TTIP will create huge increases in parts and vehicle exports, as well as significant efficiencies for workforces on both sides of the Atlantic. Isn't that great? With these secret trade agreements, which we've not heard, we can trust their assertions that everybody's going to win. So it's gonna be a great deal for everybody in Europe, and it's gonna be a great deal for everybody in America, and it's gonna be a great deal for everybody in, America, in Asia. Of course, not everybody is going to win. They know that. They know that they're going to export our jobs to Asia. They're going to export uh, the European jobs to Asia as well as part of this. But they tell everybody that this is going to be more efficient. Well, it's going to be more efficient for the corporations. It's not going to be more efficient uh, for the workers who are going to have their jobs exported. They say to settle trade-related investor state disputes, they want to change what currently is going on with the European Union, with the North American Free Trade Agreement, and that is this investor state dispute settlement system. Now, that's part, that's what everybody's been telling us. Of course, we haven't seen it. That's what everybody says is in the TPP and the TTIP. They're saying that instead of doing that, they want to uh, have publicly appointed judges that are subject to scrutiny and transparency rules that should replace the private arbitration of the ISDS system. I guess we can trust that, can't we? Because, you know, we have the most transparent president in history, Obama. He, he ran on a platform of transparency. And they're going to have a transparent uh, judicial system as part of this global governance that they're busy creating. And we can believe that because they're creating this all in secret. How ridiculous is this? How stupid do they think we are? They're going to tell us, they're going to tell every side that you're going to come out ahead of the other guys. They tell that to the Americans, they tell that to the Europeans, they tell that to the Asians. They tell everybody we're going to win. They tell everybody they're going to have transparency while they will not let us see the agreement. If that's true, then let us see the agreement. It's a flat out lie. They say it will certainly not undercut core European legislation in areas such as food, safety, or environmental protection. No, absolutely it will, based on everything that we've heard and the people who are creating this, we know that that's the purpose. These fears, they say, are unfounded. The TTIP is about delivering quality jobs and high standards and building a partnership that allows Europe to be a shaper 
of globalization, not just a passive observer. Look, this is being written by the multinational corporations. It is being written to overcome uh, GMO legislation, labeling legislation. We've already seen it used that way. And again, they will not let us see the mechanism. They will not let us see the treaty. They will not let us see how they are slicing the pie because they know that everything they are saying as they push this agreement along is a lie. And all of this is happening while we're watching Greece being flushed down the toilet here. The interesting thing, I think, that comes out of this is now people on the left in Europe are starting to take another look at the European Union. There's an article from the New Statesman that says, John King says, the left-wing case for leaving the EU. Of course, prior to this, it's just been Nigel Farage, the UKIP party. He says, supporters of the EU sneer at the, quote, little Englander, at those with a different opinion. But most of the arguments against membership, he says, are left-leaning and liberal. They're starting to understand that the narrative that they've been fed about UKIP, about all these other parties within Europe who are saying, we want to have control of our destiny, we want a government that is closer to us, that is not coming at us, that is not distant. All of those efforts have been portrayed as racist, as xenophobic. And now that's not true. Now the left is starting to see through that facade. Of course, that's the same facade that they come after us with in the United States, portraying any concern about national sovereignty, any concern about open borders as simply being racist and xenophobic. Take a look at this article from Donald Trump. Now, Donald Trump, of course, has been talking very bluntly about the open borders, uh, and now we just see this last weekend that one of the uh, largest drug lords, El Chapo, uh, he ran the Sinaloa cartel, uh, has just escaped from prison. And so Trump is essentially taken to Twitter telling everyone, I told you so. And very important to understand what is going on, but I think that if we look at the open borders without the context of NAFTA, without the context of these now transatlantic and transpacific agreements, if we don't understand that context, then it will devolve into something that is racist and xenophobic, and we will create a fence that will be used to contain us not to keep out other people. Let's take a look, though, at what uh, is going on between uh, Trump and uh, the, re the rest of the Republican field, and I would say the Democrats as well, because most of the Republicans are just fine, as we saw. People are, are following Trump because they are so angry that they had uh, voted the Republicans in and immediately uh, betrayed them on both Obamacare and on open borders. It says, the U.S. will invite escaped Mexican billionaire drug lord El Chapo to, quote, become a U.S. citizen, said real estate mogul Donald Trump, sardonically predicted in a tweet that was sent out last night. No, actually, he doesn't really need that. Actually, El Chapo could come live in a sanctuary city. Uh, he could get Obamacare. He could even vote without becoming a citizen. And as he points out in some of these tweets, he actually already has a California driver's license, even though he's never been a citizen. He got it back in 1988. They show the infamous drug trafficker obtained a California driver's license in 1988, even though he was already a target of the DEA, or perhaps because he was a target of the DEA or working with the DEA. Now, I said, of course, he could get Obamacare. Take a look at this article coming out of North Carolina. ACA event helps migrant workers sign up for health insurance. And of course, uh, ACA is uh, Affordable Care Act. That's what we call Obamacare because there's nothing affordable about it. Here's an example. After picking fruit and vegetables in North Carolina fields for 17 years, Alfredo Montoya now has health insurance. The 48-year-old father of four from Mexico is now getting affordable health care. You understand this is just a couple of weeks after the Supreme Court said that these subsidies could be done by the federal government. That's the other aspect of the open borders. It's Cloward and Piven strategy. It's a divide and conquer as well as taking down the economy by burdening it in a way that we see happening already in Greece. You don't have the welfare state ramping up fast enough, just bring in more people and put them on the dole. They're going to get subsidized health care paid for by the federal government. And of course, that's the essence of this. The fact that people who are not citizens of America are given privileges that Americans don't get. Out-of-state tuition in every state. Free health care without paying taxes. And the benefit of, if you commit a crime, being treated as if you have diplomatic immunity. That's the thing that gets people so upset. The fact that 
You have people who can commit crimes repeatedly, and then you have a catch and release system that just turns them out. Well, of course, as Lord Moncton is looking at this from Europe, he points out that for America's economy, the end is nigh. This is an article from WND. He points out that the U.S. public debt is now $18.3 trillion. He says by the time Obama leaves the White House next year, he will have doubled the debt in a single presidency. And on top of that, we now have unfunded liabilities of at least $100 trillion. And that's not even counting the open-ended aspect of having open borders where anyone can come into the country from anywhere in the world, not just from Mexico or Central America. They can come in from China. They can come in from India. And we don't know what that liability is going to be. And we do not know how we're going to pay the Social Security, how we're going to pay the health care bill. And he points out further, he says the Fed is essentially bankrupt. He says on a mark-to-market basis, in other words, if they were to look at their assets at the current market value, the Fed is trading while it is insolvent. That is illegal for any bank. But of course, laws don't apply in the reality-free zone of the Federal Reserve. Stay with us right after the break. We're going to talk about the movement in Europe as well as in America against free speech. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, it's not just a rush to world government based on secret trade treaties or on the sky is falling climate alarmism. No, we also see that there's a full rush across the West, Europe and America, to an Orwellian state, to a brave new world. Wherever there's some kind of uh, decadent entertainment, that is celebrated. But whenever there is political speech, that is repressed, stomped on with an iron boot. Take a look at this new law coming out of Spain. 1984 comes to Europe, the end of free speech in Spain. This is an article from Zero Hedge. They say Spain has shown that it is fully on board with the Brussels authoritarian direction of ending democracy. Those in power have simply convinced themselves that the people do not understand what's good for them, so they must impose their will on the rest of the people by raw force. Now listen to these different laws that have just gone into effect today. Number one, if you photograph security personnel, share these images on social media, you can get up to 30,000 euro fine. If you tweet or retweet information, even retweet information, about the, quote, location of an organized protest, that can now be interpreted as an act of terrorism. Snowden-like whistleblowing is now defined as terrorism. Visiting or consulting terrorist websites, even for investigative purposes, can be interpreted as an act of terrorism. And don't tell any jokes about the royal families. Any satirical comment against the royal family is a new crime against the crown. We are going back into the dark ages where you could not say anything about the king. And of course, the king now is not just the royal family that they have in Spain, the royal family they have in the UK, but of course, it is also those who are supposed to be our elected representatives. Look at the sixth one here. No more hassling elected members of the government or even local authorities. Even though you elect them, you see, you're, they're not your uh, elected representatives, they are now your authoritarian masters. You just get to pick a new master as a slave every couple of years. They say, even if they say one thing in order to be elected, but then they go on and do the exact opposite. No, 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 don't hassle them and don't, number eight, protest in any spontaneous way outside of parliament. That is now illegal. We're not that far from that here in the United States, quite frankly, we just don't bother to pass laws. We have had situations in the last several presidential election cycles in both parties' major uh, conventions. They have taken demonstrators far away from wherever they're holding the, the convention, put them in cages, and said, you can exercise your free speech right here. One of the most important aspects of free speech, of course, was to address our grievances publicly. But that, now that is being put in a cage down the street. We're told that free speech is simply about getting as decadent as you want in public. That is not the case. We're being sold a brave new world agenda, and if we don't buy into it, if we try to talk about something serious, about politics, about things that really affect our lives, again, we get the Orwellian treatment. Take a look at what's going on in the UK, of course. Top computer security expert warns that David Cameron's plan to ban encryption would destroy the Internet. This is an article that's up on Infowars.com from Liberty Blitzkrieg. They point out that uh, he wants to essentially ban encryption. That's the way that he wants to shut this down. As Bruce Schneer said, my immediate reaction was disbelief 
followed by confusion and despair. The article goes on to say, when it comes to the war on terror, the UK embraces a unique form of paranoia and hatred for civil liberties that leaves pretty much all the other Western nations in the dust. They say, of course, Cameron is now declaring war on encryption. In other words, a war on private communications between citizens. And just in case you're feeling good about the fact that uh, you don't live in the UK, understand that US FBI Chief James Comey fully is behind this same agenda. He's trying to sell the same thing in the United States. Well, joining us now is Joe Biggs, because we want to talk about what is happening in the United States in an even more subtle way, an attack on free speech. Well, Joe, there's an article on Infowars.com today, a Twitter campaign to encourage people to rip down Confederate flags. You just had somebody send you a Confederate flag. Presumably, it wasn't part of this Twitter campaign. Tell us about it. Yeah, so a friend of a friend sent me this. She's very liberal and really just wanted to kind of part ways with it. She doesn't agree with it. She's kind of jumped on the bandwagon. I don't think she quite understands the Gotta history. Gotta get it out of the house. Yeah, she don't <laughs> think she quite understands the history behind it because this isn't the Confederate flag. It's the battle flag, yeah. first and foremost. And this was the battle flag from Tennessee. So uh, Army of Northern Virginia. Yeah, Northern yeah. Virginia. That's yeah. right, Northern Virginia. So there's a lot of people out there who see headlines and they regurgitate it. You know, we, we keep seeing that people want to dig up these Confederate war generals. Yeah. And it's just because of regurgitated stuff. And this, it's the same thing with this flag campaign. People automatically are seeing that it means hate yeah. without really knowing the true meaning behind it or what it is. And they're running around. Now, if you run on someone's property, I myself, if I see someone jumping out of a car and running at my house at full speed, ripping something off my property, yeah, I'm going to oh, yeah. react. And that's yeah. what's going to happen. I think this is retarded. In a sense, because I'm, I'm scared that people are going to end up getting shot. Someone's going to get hurt. This isn't funny. You're going beyond that. That's a criminal act. You're stealing. Well, Joe, this is a part of a divide and conquer strategy. And, of course, the thing that concerns me most about this is how easily people are fooled, how easily they can be, uh, they, they can fall into this thing of uh, 1984, the two minutes of hate that we saw directed at Goldstein. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, what the history is. They're willing, as I talked about on Friday, they're willing to take Song of the South and flush that down the memory hole along with everything else. When that was a book that was set up, the guy who wrote that compiled stories that had been told to him by slaves, that, and it was after slavery was over, but he wanted to honor their story tales. Aesop's Fables, that was written by a Greek slave. You know, all slaves were not black people in the South. We've had slavery throughout history, and when you take and away- slavery Uncle, still going on. Exactly, when you take away Uncle Remus because it has some tangential uh, you know, connection to uh, plantations and that sort of thing, then basically what you're doing is you're eradicating African-American culture as well. It's not just white culture, it's not just Southern culture, but it's African-American culture. Instead, we ought to be selecting the best out of all these cultures, celebrating them, looking at the brotherhood of man, looking at the fact that you've got in that movie, Song of the South, which Disney refuses to, has always refused to sell here in the United States, you've got children, black and white, sitting at the feet of an older man who happens to be black and listening to his words of wisdom, talking about the brow rabbit and the tar baby and all these wonderful allegories that they have in that story. Well, people act like this flag is responsible for the killings in Charleston. What happened to holding yeah. individuals accountable yeah. for their actions? Why is, there the, why is there this mass campaign? Well, they never do that. They always seize on one particular, in, uh, uh, one particular incident and then they'll go after whether it's guns or whether it is culture now, culture attack that they want to go after. It's never about that individual. It's always about something else that they but make. But where it does in. it end, though? Where does it ever stop? Because I don't think it's going to end, Joe. You know, I, this is one thing that really bothered me. And, of course, this is now we see a new book from the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Ghost Set a Watchman. And what they've done is they've taken Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird, somebody who has been a hero to many people, including myself. He's just a fictional character, but this is a lawyer who stood up for due process. He stood up for treating people equally, and now they have put out a book that uh, reinvents him as a Ku Klux Klan member, somebody who is rabidly racist because, Joe, we can't have, we're not allowed to have good role models, no. people that we can look up to, people that we can learn from, and especially not if they're white Southern males. As soon as you do anything positive, nowadays they just want to completely find something to demonize you. Yeah. And it happens time and time again. Yes, yes, absolutely. One more article here before we go to break. 
The Maryland state song is now being targeted because it has Confederate sympathies, and so they want to remove the state song of Maryland. This is a good example of people not understanding what their history is. When you look at the lyrics of this, and of course it's sung to the tune of O Tannenbaum or O Christmas Tree, the despot's heel is on thy shore, his torch is at thy temple door, avenge the patriotic gore, whatever, that flecked the streets of Baltimore. So there were some riots there. They don't understand, when they talk about the despot's heel is on your shore, they were talking about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had just locked up a third of the Maryland state legislature, as well as jailing one of their congressmen, not charging them with a crime, but because he knew that they were sympathetic to secession. So to keep that from happening, he essentially enacted the NDAA. If you don't understand what the history is, it's going to be shoved down your throat until you understand what it is. And so people ought to just ought to take a step back and learn a little bit of history. Go back and do something besides reading the hagiographies that are in the history books. Joe, your final comment. Would you well, about Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, for example, they were yeah. wanting to dig up his grave. Now, a lot of people don't know the history behind this man, but he was actually banished from, kicked out from the KKK because he didn't uh, agree with killing black people. We can't be bothered with that kind of detail. I mean, we just but, have but, to expose But all it takes is going and reading a book <laughs> and looking for the information and finding out the truth instead of just turning on Fox News, CNN, and regurgitating the same lies over and over again. That's what's so scary. He even gave a lot mentality. of his property away to slaves. Exactly. That's what's so scary is the, is the herd mentality and how easily people are pushed into a kind of a Jacobin... Uh, uh, approach where they just go out and start rounding people up and take them to the guillotine. I mean, I guess that's going to be the next thing. Maybe when they dig up his body, they can take him to the guillotine. Stay with us. We're going to be right back with some more analysis of what's going on in Greece, a special report from John Bowne. We'll be right back. The TPP is secret. Three sections are public that were leaked. Draconian takeover of free speech, banking, uh, private property, local hospitals, uh, a total control of society. You expand from there. Greece has a historic no vote. And now their president was basically held overnight. Uh, suddenly we hear in the morning that, oh, there is a deal, despite how the people voted, and the infrastructure is being handed over to Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and others that control the EU. The EU is designed to take over nations and bankrupt them. It was Goldman Sachs and others that helped get Greece into the euro and lied about the debts to, again, position them. This is economic conquest in their own words. This has come out in the Economic Forum minutes. It's come out in the World Bank and IMF documents. This is a predatory fact. Yes, it's true that the country had socialist politicians put into power to maneuver them towards being dependent. But the lion's share of the debt is derivatives they've been signed on to. So the point is they will never emerge from economic bondage if they're unable to self-determine. So now their vote of the people in the birthplace of people power, Greece, has been overrun and overruled and it's not even really in the news. Or it's a footnote in the Wall Street Journal or a footnote in AP. Oh, overnight a deal was struck for the entire infrastructure, the national parks, the islands, the airports, the roads. It'll all now be in secret meetings given away at pennies on the dollar as a direct tax by the banks. Oh, oh, and capital controls for six months. Oh, and direct taxes out of your paycheck to private banks. This is direct payment to the mega banks. What did they call for three years ago at Davos? London Independent headline. Soros and others want 100 trillion a year liquidity. Davos is the headline, wants 100 trillion every decade to be paid to them. This is true corporate private global governance and is the model that will then take down Spain, Portugal, Ireland, uh, Italy, then France, then the UK. And this is the direct plan. We broke this down in my film Endgame eight years ago. Just, just to document that this is not us speculating on current events. We predicted it all. David Knight has got a stack of breaking news on this front, David, I gotta tell you, the most amazing facet of all this for me is that it's not in the headlines, stealth coup in Greece. We need to get our writers yeah, on this right yeah. now and, uh, to, to get an article out because no one else, it seems, there are a few Greek newspapers saying it, this is unprecedented, and the people are saying, why do we even vote a week ago, Sunday? Well, 
A week later, boom, what happened? Chronicle it right now, David Knight. Well, there is a hashtag, Alex, out there, hashtag this is a coup. And the former finance minister, Varoufakis, has said that uh, this, he compared it to the 1967 coup d'etat that installed the military dictatorship in Greece. He says, in the coup d'etat, the choice of weapon used in order to bring down democracy then was tanks. This time, it is the banks. The Financial Times has dubbed it the most intrusive economic supervision program ever mounted in the EU. This is a situation, Alex, where they're going to be raising pensions. They're going to be cutting uh, they're going to be cutting pensions, they're going to be raising taxes, they're going to raise the retirement age. They're even telling them, Alex, that they've got to work longer hours. They're going to, uh, the EU is saying you're going to have to get rid of those uh, laws that say that, that stores can't be open on Sundays. This harkens back to what Jeb Bush just said this last week. The media softened it. They said, well, he said people need to work longer hours. He, he just meant that they need to have the opportunity to work longer hours. That's not where these people are coming from. And the real concern is that over the will of the people. I mean, a, a week ago, we were all excited. We saw the Greek people say... Oh, we knew they were going to strike back, and Curtin M.O. wrote, they're going to launch a coup. Yeah, yeah. We saw the Greek people say, Mulan Labe, come and take it in defiance. This week, we see after they browbeat uh, the, the prime minister of Greece, uh, he says, come and take it in a supine position. Uh, they said two different reports said he looked like a beaten dog after he came out of these meetings. Absolutely. Uh, whenever uh, Nigel Farage, the leader of UKIP in the EU Parliament, said, you know, you, you've done the right thing, but now they're going to come after you. You need to de devalue currency now. Folks will want to come there because it's cheap. You're going to be a slave forever if you don't do this. The EU is meant to destroy you. And then if we pull back and look at this, this is what the globalists have done in every other country. They're following a scenario here. Mm -hmm. And I want to put up the article that Kurt Nemo wrote uh, uh, Washington preparing Greek coup. That was on Tuesday, two days after they had the referendum. We had the article with the intel that they were preparing the coup. And what's wild is they admittedly have been preparing with NGOs coups inside Russia, and the Russians are not going to go along with this. So this is just incredibly dangerous. There's the headline uh, from uh, July 6. U.S. preparing coup to prevent Greece from falling under Russian influence. So so this Tuesday. You know, a week ago, Alex, they were saying the, the Greek people rejected an $8.5 billion uh, extended pretend loan. This week now, it is $86 billion total package that they're coming in. They are hammering these people to teach them a lesson. They had the uh, audacity to say no to these people. Well, we had in. the intel that they wanted them to actually vote no and that they were really getting them ready to set them up. Yeah, yeah. They're going to take $50 billion worth of hard assets. I think it's it's not only a financial move, but it's also, I think, symbolic. They're going to take their power generation stations. They're going to put it into a fund. They're totally course, conquering them. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. totally conquering them. And notice, just like all these other countries they've done it to, they'll never get out of it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then it'll make the culture go completely criminal, not paying taxes, drugs, prostitution, which the globalists will then launder and control as well. And they'll go the way of Mexico, the way of everybody else. That's the way that it's always been. Going back to the uh, World Bank, the IMF fund, they were talking about how you're making loans to countries that's not about improving their infrastructure or their productivity. You're making loans to them to increase a welfare state the, because you're seeking rent. You want to turn them into renters. Well, the IMF and surf. World Bank are on record. They only give the money to their private global subsidiaries. That's they right. don't give the loans to the countries. That's right. They give the loans to their companies. And they go, we'll give a $2 billion loan to a national district for your water. Uh, if you give it to us, the water district, say, in one country I was reading was worth like $20 billion. They get it for a couple billion dollars, and then they still keep them in debt after the purchase for the maintenance of it and then double and triple water prices. Yeah. I, I mean, this is a this is the opposite of privatization. Well, Varoufakis had addressed, uh, back in the middle of June, he had addressed a, a meeting, and he said, if you really want to... Pay off the private investors in Greece and Greek, uh, people who have loaned this money to the Greek people. He said he opposed this because he knew that they couldn't pay it. He knew that they were going into debt that they were not going to be uh, able to get out of. He goes, but they've enacted these austerity programs which make us even less able to pay the debt. That's in the IMF that's World the Bank plans leaked in 2002. Exactly. Is they raise the taxes so it's impossible. They already have huge taxes on tourism. They wanted to add another 15% VAT across the board, which will make it too expensive to go there. Yeah. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. It'd be like telling a hamburger place, you got to charge 50 bucks for a hamburger when your competitors' burgers are just as good for $7. And they always love to pull this in when they've got a socialist government or when they've got a Democrat 
in charge of, uh, of, of the U.S. and the president, they bring in the North American Free Trade Agreement, or they bring in the TPP, the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trans-Pacific Agreements, because they know that uh, they're going to get a large part of that uh, political party thinking, we're going to be protected because we've got a guy who's standing there for the people. Look at what Hugo Chavez did in Venezuela. The bankers were bragging about how they got 700% return from Venezuela because Hugo Chavez realized that their debt was most important, that they would get their money before he would get food, water, and medicine for his people. And that's precisely what has happened there. We're seeing the same kind of sellout from the socialists in Greece as well. They always sell you out the worst from their jumbo jets yeah. and their red carpets. Now, remember, we saw thousands of trillions of fake fiat counterfeit that every country signed on to in 2008, another global governance mm -hmm. move, as they threatened worldwide financial meltdown if we didn't. They drop the stock market 35%. Everybody panics. We'll do whatever you want. Yep. They're given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars per megabank. Uh, they're given trillions in open window Federal Reserve money, 0% interest. Mm -hmm. And then they sit around lecturing everyone saying, you've got to work more hours. Yes. It is simply insane knowing that America has the hardest working people in the world if you work. If you work, they've got international studies. The working class in America, that means middle class as well, works on average 67 hours a week. The other average in Europe, something like 41. Now imagine, 41 hours isn't lazy. 67 isn't lazy. So they know those of us that are prideful, those of us that like to work, those of us that wouldn't be caught dead in a, in a, in a welfare line, they know those of us that don't want to figure out subsidies and play the games and take the politicians out, you know, out to dinner and give money to the mayor so they make me tax exempt locally. I mean, I've been told by tax lawyers that's what you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you give political money, you go out to dinners, you do all this, and then you get to. I mean, it's insane. They know we won't do that, so they can just keep raising taxes, raising taxes. And we told everybody. They want digital money. They want to get rid of cash so they can shut down grassroots economies and so they can take over every single economy in the world and then just take the money out of your account. Six months of capital controls. They're saying they're going to grab 30% out of everybody's bank accounts in Greece on top of their whole infrastructure. And you watch. We'll be here in five years talking about another bailout. Jakari Jackson here. Now, every now and then I'm listening to the Alex Jones radio show and he'll say something that's so sensational that even I can't believe it. I've worked here for three years and occasionally it's, I'm just like, that's no way that that is possible. But he was talking today about how there is a government funded study to investigate why lesbians are fat. I'm dead serious. And I have the article right here. Taxpayers spend $3.5 million to find out why lesbians are fat. Now, first of all, it, it very much offends me that they're running this study on the taxpayer's dime because as a single male with no dependents, they love to take money out of my check. But it's not about lesbians. If they were doing a study about why football fans eat chicken wings and enjoy beer commercials with large-breasted women, I'd be equally offended that they're wasting my money on such matters. But we have the article here. The study, Sexual Orientation and Obesity, seeks to determine why there is a disparity and the obesity rates between straight women and lesbian women and straight men and gay men. Also goes on to point out how, by contrast, many, I guess, homosexual men are a lot thinner than heterosexual men. Even though there's a report that came out earlier this year about how the average American is about 30 pounds heavier than they were 30, 40 years ago. But this isn't the only way the U.S. is wasting your taxpayer dime. We have the article, Congressman Publishes 10 Worst Examples of Government Waste. And I'll just stick to one, U.S. Builds Melting Walls. The U.S. military spent over $400,000 on a train facility in Afghanistan that melted when it rained. Not to mention uh, funding ISIS with grenades and running guns to Mexican drug cartels, but that's a story for a different day. And also... Swedish Massages for Rabbits. This is about well, close to about $400,000 and talks about how the National Institute of Health paid for a two-year study that involved giving rabbits daily post-exercise rubdowns by a mechanical device that has long-flowing strokes used in Swedish massages. Dead serious. And also, synchronized swimming for sea monkeys at about $300,000. 
Three federal agencies supported a study measuring the swirl created by collective movements of sea monkeys. And this is just a very short list of government-funded waste. There are many more examples. I'm sure you can add your own in the comments below. But this is what they're doing. I always talk about taxes and taxes, and you would think, or I guess they would like you to think, that your tax money goes to some greater cause. And sometimes it does, but you can see right here, proof positive, several hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions or billions of dollars, are being wasted on things that we just flat out don't need. You can find more reports on the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. I can answer the Fed's question. Taxpayers spend $3.5 million to find out why lesbians are so fat. Conversely, gay men end up being, being very, very skinny, and it all ties into hormone imbalances in most cases. Well, with waste like that, many Americans are still taking a holier-than-thou attitude toward the Greek taxpayers, saying they deserve austerity, they deserve tax increases, pension cuts. Waste is much worse here in America. Now, of course, a week ago, many people thought that Greece would leave the European Union. Nigel Farage, Eurosceptic, leader of the UKIP party, pointed out that they should leave with their head held high. Instead, the prime minister left like a whipped dog, being told, you're not going to leave this room, and presumably, you're not going to leave this union. Here with more to break that down is John Bowne. Last week, after the courageous vote of the Greek people to not accept a bailout from the EU World Bank regime, UKIP leader Nigel Farage urged Greek Prime Minister Alex Tsipras to throw off the shackles of EU domination and embrace the hard path towards his country's independence and democracy. What we're seeing in this chamber this morning, and indeed across the whole of Europe, is an irreconcilable cultural difference between Greece and Germany, a split between the north and the south of Europe. Europe, the European project is actually beginning to die. Nobody in this room will recognize that, but actually the peoples of Europe are saying we were never asked whether we wanted this. This has been foisted upon us. And we need to understand why EMU doesn't work. Those monsters, Cole and Mitterrand, backed up with a clever but dangerous to law, believed that if they put in place an economic and monetary union, then as night follows day, there would be political union, that there would be an acceptance of this project, that the north and south of Europe would converge, that we'd all start to love each other, that we'd all begin to feel a European identity, that we'd all begin to show allegiance to the flag and the anthem. Those of us, of course, that criticised this were told that we were extremists and we lacked vision. Well, one vision we didn't lack is we understood that the countries of Europe are different. And that if you try and force together different people or different economies without first seeking the consent of those people, it is unlikely to work. And the plan has failed. Uh, Mr. Sibras, your, your country should never have joined the Euro. I think you've acknowledged that. But the big banks, the big businesses and big politics forced you in. Goldman Sachs, the German arms manufacturers, they were all very happy. And when the bailouts began, they weren't for the Greek people. Those bailouts were to bail out French, German and Italian banks. They haven't helped you at all. And these years of austerity, these years of high unemployment, of increasing poverty, none of it's worked. In fact, your, your debt-GDP ratio has gone from 100% at the start of the crisis to 180% right now. But, sir, you cannot have your cake and eat it. They will give you no more, these people. They can't afford to. If they give you more, they'll have to give other Eurozone members more. So your moment has come. And frankly, if you've got the courage, you should lead the Greek people out of the Eurozone with your head held high. Get back your democracy. Get back control of your country. Give your people, give your people the leadership and the hope that they crave. Days later, Cyprus caved to the EU's bailout. Greek comedian Zissis Rombus quantified the roller coaster ride of the Greek people's vote of no and the leadership's vote of yes when he said, Greece is the only country where no really does mean yes. A meeting of the 28 Euro Union leaders was canceled as creditors demanded that Cyprus pass major tax reforms and spending cuts that would hit the strapped people of Greece even harder. Reforms Cyprus has packaged with overwhelming support from the Greek parliament. 
but time and money are running out. EU Economic Affairs Commissioner Pierre Moscovici said, if the Greek government commits to implement and vote now without delay, strong reforms in the short term, there is the basis of negotiations. But German hardliners are suggesting Greece exit from the euro. Meanwhile, Greek citizens are limited to withdraw $67 per day until the money runs out. Greece was unable to pay its June 30th payment to the IMF as figures show Greek debt to be as high as 200%, according to Maltese finance minister Edward Sisluna. If all parties in the euro agree, this would be the third bailout for Greece in five years. We are fundamentally witnessing history repeat itself as Cyprus finds himself in the same fight against tyrannical oligarchs, the great six century Athenian lawgiver Solon delivered his country from. It's time that all countries under IMF World Bank global domination pull themselves up from their bootstraps and cast off the sovereignty murdering New World Order beast. But here's the warning. If uh, this one has failed, imagine how much bigger the failure will be when the UN gets its way in Paris this December and sets up a world government which is like the EU, but on a global scale, with no escape for anyone, at least at the moment. If you don't like the EU, you can get out and go to the States or go to, go to somewhere, Canada, Australia. You don't have to be in the EU. But if there's a global government, there's no escape unless you've got a spaceship. John Bound for InfoWars.com.